morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences of ACNS webinars in different parts of the world. Welcome back to yet another edition of ACNS webinars. The speaker for the first session of today is our honored guest from Brazil, Professor Paulo Kadri. Professor Kadri completed his graduate school and neurosurgery residency at the Patel University of Sao Paulo. And he did his doctoral thesis at the University de Sao Paulo and postdoctoral at the University of Arkansas. He currently serves as the adjunct professor of neurosurgery at the Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul, Sao Paulo, Brazil. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars, and today he'll be talking about surgical approaches to temporal horn. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from China, Professor Wang Ting. Professor Ting is the consultant neurosurgeon, Department of Neurosurgery at the West China Hospital, Sichuan University. She mainly engages in clinical research and cerebrovascular diseases, focusing on endovascular intervention treatment of aneurysms, AVMs, AV fistulas, and other hemorrhagic diseases. We are extremely honored to have her today at our webinars as a speaker, and she'll be talking about superior petrosinus DAVF. The chair for the first session of today is our honored guest from Design Switzerland, Professor Roy Thomas Daniel. Professor Daniel originally hails from India and completed his neurosurgery residency at the Christian Medical College, Vellur. He joined his alma mater as an associate professor of neurosurgery before being appointed full professor there in 2006. He joined the Department of Clinical Neurosciences at the Hospital Center of Ward University in 2009 as visiting professor at UNIL and assistant physician in the neurosurgery services of the CHU. His clinical responsibilities cover skull based surgeries and vascular surgeries, and he was promoted to the chief physician at the CHU two years later. He then took over the responsibility of all pediatric neurosurgery at the CHU. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the first session of Professor Paulo Kadri. The chair for the second session of today is our honored guest and senior faculty from Hyogo, Japan, Professor Shinichi Yoshimura. Professor Yoshimura is a professor and chairman, Department of Neurosurgery, Hyogo College of Medicine, Japan. Professor Yoshimura was a past president of the Japan Society of Neuroendovascular Therapy. He is a board member of the Japanese Society of Neuroendovascular Therapy, the Japanese Neurosurgical Congress, and counselor of the Japanese Stroke Association. He was also the past editor of the Journal of Neuroendovascular Therapy. He was the president of Mount Fuji Congress as well as the Japanese Neurosurgical Congress in the past. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Wong Ting. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the president of Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs, and all the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A warm welcome to our colleagues in China, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to our first chair, Professor Roy Thomas Daniel. Thank you, um, uh, Professor um, uh, Raja, for giving this, uh, for starting this whole program. Uh, and you've selected excellent topics for uh, today. Uh, the, the, the first topic, of course, is approach to the temporal horn. And the approaches for the temporal horn um, uh, assume a lot of importance, especially in epilepsy surgery, for instance, for one, then for intraventricular tumors, for glioma surgery. So uh, the, the knowledge of the anatomy around the temporal horn, especially the white matter anatomy is of uh, Cru crucial importance uh, in most of these procedures and uh, uh, knowledge of the vascular and the white matter anatomy in that region is uh, primordial for dealing with lesions uh, like tumors or for epilepsy uh, of this uh, region. And as you know, the most, uh, most common cause for, uh, temporal, uh, for uh, intractable epilepsy is temporal lobe epilepsy essentially related to the mesial temporal structures. So I have no doubt that this lecture is uh, well selected and I congratulate um, uh, uh, Professor Krishnan Kuti for selecting this lecture and also for inviting uh, 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 Professor uh, uh, Paulo from uh, Brazil, Sao Paulo, Brazil for giving us insights into uh, the surgery into this region. So without uh, taking too much time, I'd like to invite uh, with great pleasure, Professor Paulo Kadri from Sao Paulo to give us his lecture. Good evening, everybody. Good morning here in Brazil. It's really an honor. I'd like to, to thank the, the committee, Professor Kato, Professor Haja, for the such invitation. And we are gonna talk about the access to the temporal, medial temporal region an anatomical base for the access of the middle temporal region. So as Professor Roy told us, although we do have neoplastic and vascular lesions inciding 
in the temporal horn, in the medial temporal region, most of the discussion that we have is related to the hypocampal sclerosis and the surgical treatment of epilepsy refractory to medication. We do have to take in mind that the medial temporal region, it's completely surrounded by parenchyma by the brain brain. So doesn't matter which approach that you are gonna take to leave you or to guide you towards the ventricle. It will have to go through the brain parenchyma, cutting, damaging the cortical surface, the white matter until you get inside the ventricle through the ventricle walls. We can divide didactically the surgical approach to the region in three main. Through the lateral approach, through the suicide and gyros on the lateral approach. The most utilized one is the middle temporal gyros, the Niemeyer approach, so-called Niemeyer approach. We can also go from the inferior surface through the parahypocampal or through the fusiform gyros. Or we can choose the transylvian approaches. Those are divided in the classic yasser approach, which you do make an incision after wide open of the sylvian fissure in the inferior peninsular sulcus at the level of the limen insula. And then you find the amygdala remove the amygdala and through the amygdala, you create your corridor towards the ventricle to remove the hypocampal formation. And the other one, it's a variation that actually Professor Yashagil had already described in his la later articles that nowadays referred as the trans uncle approach, which is the variation where you advance more anteriorly and do your incision on the anterior portion of the ankles to also through the amygdala get inside the temporal horn. Two concepts that we choose whenever approach inside the brain you're thinking of. That's the maximal exposure of the, the, the lesion with the minimum trauma to the parenchyma. Less trauma will mean less neurological post-operative deficit, if you have, of course. And we do know that lesions of the connection fibers of the white matter might have more severe and long-lasting deficit than cortical lesions. So we do have to take this in account. Whenever we discuss about approaching the temporal horn or approaching the medial temporal region, there is always a referral and discussion in the literature about the optic radiation and the post-operative visual field defects and how to avoid it. This is since the description of this death by Cushing. Now, we do have to take an account that whenever you're going to do any of these approaches, you are facing long, short, association fibers, commissural fibers, and also projection fibers. So this is a list of the structures that we do have to take in our mind. The short U fibers, the long association fibers on the lateral surface of the superior uncinate and occipital frontal fascicle, on the inferior surface of the inferior longitudinal fascicle and on the medial surface of the sphingle. The commissural fibers of the anterior commissure and the tapetum of the corpus callosum. The projection fibers of the inferior and the posterior thalamic peduncle and the temporal pontine tract. And of course, the goal of our approach or our treatment is the removal of the hypocampal formation and the amygdala. Now, the optic radiation is just a portion of the posterior thalamic pedant. The rest of these fibers 
we do know that they are involved in memory, language, and emotional behavior. So reviewing this anatomy, we do know that on the lateral surface, the cortical surface is the so-called neocortical surface. On the neocortical surface, once you remove the cortex, you're gonna face the short U fibers, the intergyral fibers. Those are very well developed and make the main banco of the white matter on the lateral surface. On the medial surface, related to the limbic lobe and the limbic system, the U fibers are less, much less developed. Once you remove the U fibers, you go to the deeper layer, the association layer, the long association fibers. On the lateral surface, especially on the left side, the superior longitudinal fascicle is the language fascicle. It's the connection in mainly in the language related areas. We can divide it in an horizontal portion, on a vertical portion, and also in the so-called arcuate portion. Over the temporal horn, the inferior arm, the inferior arm of the superior temporal horn, uh, of the superior longitudinal fascicle is the one that we have to take in account. And we do know that this is related not only to language, but also in all the spatial perception, and in some case may also led to depression in post-operative post uh, uh, period. Over the insula, once you remove the cortex, you're gonna face the U fibers that actually compose what we call the extreme capsule. Those fibers are connecting the long and short gyros of the insula, but also this region with the opercular. Those are limbic connections, especially on the inferior portion, because the anterior portion of the insula is the so-called limbic area of the insula collecting towards the most anterior portions of the temporal area. At the level of the limbic insula, we're gonna face two fascicles, the occipital frontal fascicle and the uncinate fascicle. They are both passing through the limbic insula. The occipital frontal fascicle has a dorsal segment and a ventral segment. Both of them originate in the same prefrontal area, orbital frontal and prefrontal area. And the dorsal segment goes towards the inferior parietal and superior occipital region, where the ventral segment goes in the inferior occipital and most posterior areas of the temple. They are mainly related to association of memory and uh, visual areas also. Now the uncinate fascicle is considered a limbic connection because it's originated on the most posterior portion of the orbital region and is directly towards the most anterior portion of the temporal and the most anterior, anterior portion of the anus. This might be divided also in a dorsal lateral segment, more posterior related, and a ventral medial segment, more anterior related. Those are mainly related with disturbance of postoperative memory, especially related to personal concepts. The other fiber that now are in that risk on the lateral surface, it's the commissural fibers of the anterior commissure. The anterior commissure once pass through the lentiform from the most ventral aspect of the lentiform nucleus, it opens up like a fan towards the temporal horn. It can be divided in an anterior and posterior segment. There is very few uh, studies or few descriptions of lesions of the anterior commissure. But we do know that most of the time, you can have lesions of the anterior commissure with also lesions of this, the corpus callosum and the fornix. And this is mainly related to memory disturbance. 
Once you remove the anterior commissure and the lentiform, you're going to face the corona radiata, which fibers will converge to form the internal capsule. Over the temporal horn or over the temporal region, we can divide this in a more lateral and a more medial segment of the corona radiata. On the more lateral ones are the fibers that are directly towards the peduncle and then towards the pons. So they are the temporal pontine fibers. The temporal pontine fibers, they are mainly related to ocular and head movement coordination. Now, once you remove the most superficial layer of the corona radiata, you're going to face the inner layer, which fibers are directly towards the thalamus. And over the temporal lobe, we do have the inferior thalamic peduncle, which the functions we do not know, and the characteristic turn or loop of the posterior thalamic peduncle. So although we do have several different fibers running within the posterior thalamic peduncle, the most important and eloquent are the optic radiation, which the injury at that region is related with the superior quadrantoxin. If we try to observe the inferior and the posterior thalamic peduncle from an inner dissection, we have this very important relation, especially when you are uh, thinking of your surgical approach, that those fibers, they respect the boundaries of the amygdala. As we know, the amygdala is the most anterior portion of the roof and the most anterior portion of the temporal horn, which means that if you choose a transcendental approach and you are confined to the amygdala, you should not have any injury of these projection fibers. Within the inferior surface, that if it is a very subtle uh, fascicle, the inferior longitudinal fascicle, although not very strong, it does have important connections with visual and limbic areas. So it's mainly important for the visual memory. Within the inner aspect, within the limbic lobe that on the surface is represented by the cingulate gyrus and the parahypocampal gyrus, we do have the main buncle, the main fascicle of the limbic system, association fascicle of the limbic system that is the single. And the single we can divide in a superior segment and an inferior segment. Lesions of the inferior segment are related with the autobiographic memory. So you forget faces and facts related to the family. Within the parahypocampal gyrus, we do have the most important structures of the limbic system, which are the hypocampal formation and the amygdala. We do know that those are mainly related to memory and with behavior. The inner fibers that are at risk whenever we discuss the approaches are the inner fibers of the corpus callosum, especially at the splenium. So these fibers, they go deeper and they break a very thin layer over the atrium and the temporal horn. That's called the tapito, which means carpet, which function we do not know. So coming back to our point, maximal exposure, minimum trauma. Let's go and see and compare. In all of the approaches, you have to pass through the cortex. On the lateral approach, you have to pass through the so-called neocortical cortex. Why? On the Yashar Gil, on the transylvian approach, the inferior approach, you pass through a different cortex, not so well differentiated cortex, that is the limbic cortex. Next layer, 
The next layer is going to be the association layer. So you're going to face the U fibers. As we know, the U fibers on the lateral aspect, they are very well developed. While over the limen insula, over the uncus, and over the parahypocampal gyrus, they are not so well developed. The next layer is the long association fibers. On the lateral surface, all the long association fibers are at risk if you choose any of the lateral approaches. This is one point that I forgot to say. It doesn't matter if you are going through the sulci or the gyrus. You're going to face all of the same layers of fibers in more or less amount. But you're going to you're going to pass through all of them. So on the lateral surface, you're going to face if you choose a lateral approach, the superior longitudinal, the uncinate, and the occipital frontal facet. If you choose the transylvian approach, classical as described by Asherdil, the most anterior portion of the uncinate fascicle is at risk. As long as you respect, as long as you respect the boundaries described by Asher. Because if you go further backwards along the peninsular sulcus, then you're gonna cut as much as the same amount of fibers of the lateral approach. In the trans uncle, you're not gonna cut any of the association fibers. On the inferior, you're gonna get through the single. But here I make another point. Most of the time, that's your target because you are removing the parahypocampal gyrus. You are removing the amygdala, in the, in the hypocampal formation. So in many of the approaches, you're going to cut the seam. Conitional fibers, you're going to pass through on the lateral approach, the anterior commissure, all of it, and the inner fibers of the corpus callosum, the talpita. On the classical yasser view, you're going to cut through the most anterior portion of the anterior commissure. Now, Another point here, uncinate fascicle, as I told you, is considered a limbic connection. And the anterior commissure is also, or both of them actually, seems to be very important in the spread of the, of the spikes. So this is also maybe also important to control the crisis. Projection fibers. On the lateral surface, you're going to get through the temporal pontine fibers, and you are also going to go through the posterior thalamic peduncle. If you are confined to the limits of the amygdala, in the other, all the other approaches, you are not going to get through any of the connection fibers. And your goal is to remove the amygdala and the hypocampus, so it's to remove the anterior portion of the parahypocampal gyrus. So in all of them, you're gonna get through the single, the inferior aspect of the single. So taking this in account, now we have to consider the different lesions that might uh, affect this area. And this we can divide mainly in two compartments. There is a lateral compartment, the neocortical compartment, although not a mesial portion of the temporal area, but might also affect this area. And we also have to consider, especially in big lesions, uh, the relation with the medial area. In the limbic compartment, the limbic compartment is exactly the parahypocampal gyrus. And we are going to see that then we have to consider the extension of the lesion within these compartments. So it is clear that if there is a neocortical lesion, you should favor a lateral approach because this lesion is coming to the lateral surface. So as long as there is a birthplace of the lesion, that's your entry point. Like in this case, this is a lesion that although pushes the medial temporal region medial, it's related to the lateral surface. So 
Logically, we should favor a lateral approach and get a pure lesionectomy through the lesion. Now, on the medial area, we divide it in two compartments, an anterior limbic compartment, which is mainly related to the amygdala. So in this case, I would favor the so-called transamygdala approach that can be through the transclassical Yashardil, transsylvian, transamygdala, uh, or you can try to come more anteriorly in the so-called transuncle approach. One point of the transuncle approach is that at some patients, you can try or you can favor also to remove the orbital ring to get the direct angle of the approach whenever you are doing the transylvan approach. So like in this case, there is a lesion confined to the amygdala. So we are going to favor a transylvan approach and remove purely only the amygdala. As long as we are confined to the amygdala, again, there is no lesion or no, uh, uh, no to have any damage of the projection fibers or have any uh, visual field defect. Now, posterior located lesions. Through the transylvian approach, it's more difficult to get all the way posteriorly. So in this case, even if the lesion is also extended more anteriorly, we favor an inferior approach, the transparahypocampal approach. And in this case, you have two routes. You can come from the lateral cranium and do a subtemporal approach, or you can come from the supracerebellar, open the tentorium, and get inside the ventricle through the inferior surface of the parahypocampal gyrus. So for that, lesions that are extending anterior and all the way posteriorly, all the way posteriorly within the temporal, medial temporal area, we favor uh, the supracerebellar tensitorial approach. In the same sitting position with a slight modification described by Professor Turi. So where we don't push or we don't elevate too much the troncus, so we can avoid air embolism. So it's just 25 degrees and the head is very flexed. So in this case, you can remove from the most anterior all the way towards the most posterior portion of the medial temporal region without touching the neocortical surface or the inferior surface of the temporal lobe. So this is just the same patient. You can see that we can go all the way posteriorly and we don't uh, put at risk any of the projection fibers in the same way. So the same way of thinking you can apply to others interventricular lesions. So like in the atrium or in the frontal horn, as long as you have in your mind the different layers of fibers that you're gonna pass through and then decide which approach should you get uh, to have less damage and a well or good exposure of the lesion that you're doing. Thank you. I hope I didn't pass the time. Yeah, uh, not at all, um, Professor Kadri. Um, I, I thank you for an excellent talk. I was really happy to see the selection of the topic uh, by uh, Raja and uh, Professor Yoko Kato and, to, and the fact that they invited you to give this talk because this is a, a very important uh, 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 talk because primarily uh, a lot of people uh, who are trained in the uh, who are trained before would just cut through the temporal lobe and reach the target and uh, neurosurgical education uh, of late has uh, been more reliant on uh, uh, neuro navigation and image based surgery and that i think is uh, while it's useful for surgery i think uh, neurosurgical education, which is based on image guidance, uh, 
is in a way dangerous uh, without knowledge of the white matter anatomy. Now, the knowledge of the white matter anatomy, we got it 80 years back uh, when uh, there was a technician in Basel, Switzerland called Klinger, Josef Klinger, and uh, he described it in the 40s in Basel during the Second World War and uh, in Vienna, work done in Vienna. Uh, and uh, that atlas which was published has the same technique is what we use even today. So this is a technique which has survived for 80 years. And uh, pioneers, uh, big uh, white matter specialists like Toure has trained a lot of people uh, that I know, a lot of my friends, and uh, there's an increasing uh, acceptance uh, uh, for this technique and it has persisted for 80 years. And that's extremely important to neurosurgical training. Fortunately, in the last few years, uh, there has been a lot of development in, uh, in imaging, in DTI. And there's no newer realization of the different tracks. There are new tracks being found, uh, for example, the fat, the frontal acetylene tract, for instance. So new tracks are being found. So that's one big advance which has happened. Another advance is the acceptance and the popularity that uh, awake surgery has uh, given to this uh, specialty. So more and more surgeons are getting into awake surgery. And uh, recently, actually, uh, even hypnosis. So we also started uh, using hypnosis for awake surgery. And, and what is being, what is the result of that is that uh, the function of these tracks are now being more and more uh, appreciated. And in your presentation, I was very happy to see for every single tract, uh, for most of them at least, you, you precisely told us what the function of these tracts are. Now, whether we, we are able to identify during awake surgery or not, these are all things that are developing. So the uh, neurosurgical education of the white matter anatomy, which is coupled with uh, uh, DTI and awake surgery is, uh, is a potent uh, method to treat lesions uh, in all parts, intra intraparenchymal lesions of all parts of the brain. And I would really, I I'm really happy that you illustrated this very well. I just have one or two questions for you. Uh, maybe you didn't have time to deal with that. Uh, I, I presume you're doing a lot of awake surgery. Could you give us some insights about what you would uh, monitor during approaches towards the temporal horn uh, when you do awake surgery? Yeah, um, I have to be honest with you, Professor. I don't do awake surgery. I prefer to to do the patient in the classical anesthesiology. I don't do awake surgery. Uh, but I, I, I did uh, appreciate a lot your comments. Uh, Professor Yasher, you always said that not uh, the shortest way is the safest way. You do have uh, to think what you're going through and why you are going through those uh, areas of the brain and try to damage the least. Uh, you were right also in your comment that uh, with the imagine guide, you always choose the shortest way, the direct way, think that might be the, the best uh, uh, or the safest way. Uh, that is always a problem when we are dealing with the function of these tracts, because some of them, or most of them, are very integrity. So what we call the multimodal connection fibers, which are very difficult to get uh, the precise function. As you saw, they are very packed. So there is not a real pure lesion of any of them, so we can say this fiber tract works exactly for them. On the cortical area, it's different because it is primary areas that we can really identify, uh, but on the connection system, the integration is way more uh, complex. So it's hard to tell really one single track that has this function. And this is mostly extrapolation of lesions, right? We cannot really go 
stimulate and say this tract has exactly this function. So this we also have to take into account. The complexity of the connection system of the brain is still a mystery for us. I just have one more question. I mean, uh, for epilepsy surgery, maybe these are not that much of importance because we're going to remove parts of the mesial temporal lobe. Uh, and uh, anything that avoids, generally it's accepted in under general anesthesia that if you avoid uh, cutting through the, the optic radiations, the chances of getting a functional neurological deficit is, is small really. Uh, that essentially depends on how precise your neuropsychological evaluation really is. But let's say you're approaching tumors, uh, especially meningiomas of the intraventricular lesions. Uh, would you consider other approaches? Because the classical approach to that is through the cortex. Uh, would you consider other approaches uh, from the subtemporal region or transylvian region? Or would you stick with the, the standard accepted uh, approach? Primarily because these lesions are very vascular lesions. You need to get to the vascular pedicle very fast and you need to have access and not much brain retraction. So just splitting, uh, either going through the superior temp or the middle temporal sulcus or going through the T2, would you stick with the dogma of uh, long time neurosurgery that the transcortical approaches to meningiomas of the temporal uh, atrium and the temporal horn is acceptable? Or would you consider other approaches? So I, I don't have, uh meningiomas on the temporal. I have in the atrium, right? But that's when I say vascular lesions. I do have AVNs. So it is, it is, if it is more anterior located, I would favor still the transylvan approach. And if it is more towards the atrium or posterior power portion of the temporal horn, I, I would go through the supercerebellar approach because the, the vascular supply you're gonna take from the posterior cerebral, cerebral artery very quickly in the immune system. So you would have control of that for the super uh, cerebellum. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for an excellent, excellent talk. I really enjoyed it, especially the dissections which you showed. Uh, I leave the floor open to- That, that is Klinger technique. That is Klinger technique. Yes, I was very happy to see that. And uh, thank you for showing that. Uh, I would uh, request the other panelists or the participants to ask the questions if they have any. Yes, Dr. Yubun Singh, any comments from you? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Raja. Thank you, Professor, for a very nice presentation. Uh, I just want to ask Professor regarding uh, the concept of, especially on uh, uh, what metal disease or glioma, for example, and a transcevian approach was uh, 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 chosen because want to preserve the cortex of probably some association fibers, like the case that you show in the lateral temporal lesion where the, the gray matter was preserved. And most of the glioma surgeon now go for supramarginal resection. Uh, as long as they do, do a weight cranotomy, functional area are not involved for the battery of tests that they use during the surgery, they excise the, 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 the fibers. So what, what is your opinion regarding these two different approaches? Yeah, so I, I'm uh, still, I think I'm young, I'm an old school. I was trained with uh, Professor Yasher Gill and Professor Kim. So the supra marginal concept, uh, I don't use. We stick to the pure laser anectomy, we try to stay with the lesion. Okay, so, uh, and as long as you are with the lesion, uh, we do have uh, the concept that this region, they, they not infiltrate the white matter tracts, but they expand, they displace. So you should be able, or at least uh, diminish, decrease the, the lesion to the white matter, to the fibers, if you are uh, stick with the lesion. So and then I put that, the compartments, if you have a lateral compartment, a cortical compartment of the lesion, you use a lateral approach. If the lesion is located with the parahypocampal gyrus, with the medial temporal area, so you should favor one of the anterior or inferior approaches to that area. Thank you, Professor.
Thank you. Thank you very much. We have Professor Suresh Nair with us. Professor Suresh Nair, any comments from you? Yeah, well, what an excellent talk, uh, Kadri. I really enjoyed and I appreciated the comments from uh, Dr. Roy, my very close friend. And uh, he asked a very pertinent question that uh, all these tracks become relevant when we do awake surgery. And uh, uh, actually, you know, uh, there is one uh, neurosurgeon uh, from Australia. His name is Charlie Theo. Everybody knows. He, he doesn't monitor anything. He just uses a tactile, visual, and auditory cues, and he chases the tumor. He says he can, uh, he, he, I don't want to explain what is his tactile, auditory, and visual cues which he follow, but he doesn't do any monitoring and takes most of the things out, and he doesn't believe in any of this. Uh, what uh, Professor Kadri must be doing uh, must be that only. And thanks, Roy. Nice to see you, and nice to hear comments. Yeah. Right, right. Here, sir. Thank you very much, Professor Ishmael, for those wonderful comments. Uh, if there are no more questions, we can move on to the second uh, session. And before that, we can hear the concluding remarks of Professor Roy Thomas Daniel. Well, I, I don't have too many more uh, comments. I, I congratulate uh, Professor Krishnan Guti and Professor Yoko Kato for introducing and giving us an opportunity to listen to this uh, a brilliant lecture on a topic that's often ignored by the neurosurgical community, unfortunately. <clears throat> uh, let's hope more and more younger people get into understanding uh, neuroanatomy in the right way and not being discouraged or not being uh, distracted by just uh, image guidance. Though image guidance should be used, uh, I think neuroanatomy is the key. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we move on to the second session, I would like to inform our viewers that this webinar is being broadcasted on the WeChat channel in China and also live on Zoom and YouTube. Currently, as of now, we have 1,575 people who have joined this webinar and watching us live. Thank you very much for, to all the wonderful audiences who have joined us. So now we'll move on to the second session and I would like to invite Professor Shinichi Yoshimura to say a short introduction about Petros and DAVF and invite Professor Wang Ting. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for introduction, Raja. And uh, I'm very happy to, to chair this uh, talk. Uh, talk is about uh, uh, superior petrosal sinus dural AVF. Uh, you may know that the uh, dural arterial venous hissurus uh, acquired region and that uh, occupies uh, 10 to 15% of all intracranial efficient. And uh, it's a uh, pathogenic factor is uh, not fully understood, but recently uh, uh, we know that some uh, ge genetic uh, uh, <clears throat> relationship. And dural AVF mostly commonly occurs in uh, in the vicinity of transverse sigmoid and uh, cavernous sinus. But uh, recently we are encountered a rare region like SPS to RBF. Today uh, uh, we are going to listen to the uh, uh, expert uh, uh, talk about this region treatment. Uh, we are very happy to, uh, I'm very happy to introduce um, a professor one thing. She is going to talk about the management of superior sinus dural VF. So please start your lecture, Professor Tin. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. It's my pleasure to share the experience of the treatment of superior petrol sinus DVF. Um, according to Lawton's uh, classification of tentorial DVF. Um, SPS DVF belongs to the type E, uh, of which the fistula point is often located at the collection of superior petrol sinus and uh, petrol spin. Um, this picture shows the location of SPS. Um, as we know, not everyone uh, has a completely structure of SPS. Uh, some people, someone is not well developed and then normally the petrol spin we are collected the anterior part of uh, we are collected the blood from the brainstem and the anterior part of uh, cerebellum. 
and then um, join to the uh, STS by the petrol swing. Um, but uh, when a fistula occurs, occur, uh, occurred here, the blood flow will reflux into the uh, tributaries of uh, petrol swing um, and uh, then uh, reflux to the uh, vein of around uh, to the vein around the brainstem and the cerebellum. So, um, so the tributaries of petrol vein, petrous vein, mainly, uh, mainly include three directions. One is to the control direct, uh, one is to the control lateral veins um, by the transpointing vein. One is to the supratentorial veins by the pointing, by the pointing trigeminal vein. And uh, the last one is uh, to the cerebellar vein by the by the vein of cere cerebellar pointing fissure. Um, according uh, the last one up the, uh, among the three directions to the contralateral and to the cerebellar vein are relatively safe um, because uh, for the hmm? for the communication uh, and the and uh, the cerebellar for the uh, and the and uh, for the anastomosis between the supratentorial uh, vein and the infratentorial vein, there is a, there is an important uh, uh, anastomosis. Uh, that is the lateral lateral mesencephalic vein. <laughs> so, what was the symptom of SPSD? SPSDFF will be, and the relationship between the symptom and the direction of venous drainage. Um, I will show some cases about this uh, about this PDF. Uh, according to this, uh, just like this case, the patients just have the only just have one direction reflux to the cerebellar vein. And this patient don't have uh, specific uh, symptoms, just have uh, he uh, reflux just like this and uh, just have dizziness. And this patient uh, is asymptomatic and uh, uh, is asymptomatic and the, uh, the, the reflex, reflex in the uh, direction is the reflex direction is uh, to the cerebellar vein. But uh, under this patient, the, the DFF was revealed by physical examination. Um, how about this case? This case is different, since it goes different. You can see there is a huge aneurysm, huge aneurysm, um, huge venous aneurysm, and it has two directions, the reflux. Uh, one is to the supratentorial uh, vein, one to the cerebellar vein. Um, but, the, um, but, the ref, uh, but the venous and your rhythm is uh, um, just, just like this. And the venous and your rhythm can compress the trigeminal nerve. So the patient has a facial numbness. As you can, as shown in the picture, the, tri the trigeminal nerve is near to uh, petrol, petrol vein and the transponding vein in, and the pointing trigeminal vein. So they are very close. If there is a uh, venous aneurysm, it can compress the it it can compress the trigeminal vein um, to cause some cause some some uh, symptoms. And this case is similar to the previous to to, to the previous um, to, uh, to the previous case. But it is ruptured, caused the subarachnoid hemorrhage, and the symptom of this patient is caused by uh, SAH. How about this case? This case has two, has also two uh, reflux directions: one to the sup, uh, supratentorial vein, one to the contralateral vein, uh, and you can see the uh, venous aneurysm is a little higher than the previous case. But this patient. Just like this, and this patient um, is uh, uh, this patient is uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. So, how about the blood failure? The blood failure is from uh, in this in this regional DFF is very is very complicated and rich. 
uh, most uh, um, maybe from the territorial branches of uh, PCA, SCA, just like in the literature we call the, uh, the artery of Davidoff and the Sketcher. And of course, the EC branches, such, such as the internal maxillary artery, uh, occipital artery, transosseous branches, and the uh, posterior auricular artery. Uh, of course, the most important uh, branch may be middle meningeal artery. And uh, uh, of course, the uh, pica, the meningeal branch, the meningeal branch of uh, anterior inferior, uh, the, the meningeal branch of ica, pica, also can feed, can feed the fistula. So often from, often from both anterior and posterior circulation and um, rarely from bilateral because the fistula point is often ipsilateral. Uh, how about the endovascular treatment route? Uh, always we use, uh, um, we rarely, transvenous route is of high risk and not recommended because the special drainage of SPS. Um, uh, I think there are two reasons um, why, we, uh, why transvenous route is um, um, not recommended because the vein always tortures and uh, tortures and dilated. It is difficult and dangerous to place the microcarcerator trans the trans the dilated vein um, by street centers and uh, sigmoid centers. Um, second, the superior uh, superior petrol centers is not always uh, is not always well developed. Although it is well developed, the high flow will disturb the disturb the show of SPS. So transarterial route is frequently, uh, is frequently applied and uh, which artery is more preferred or com commonly used in our center. Um, this is the first case is of um, 35, female, 35 year old female, this is for half a year. And we, and we choose the Petros branch of MMA and you can see the location of the micro cancer uh, tip. And after injection of um, uh, of onyx, um, you can see the onyx cast. Careful, careful of the careful of here. You can see the uh, onyx in the cerebellar vein. How about uh, um, because at the start, because at the start of injection, the uh, onyx diffuses too fast, and the blood flow is very high, and the onyx uh, flows too far away, flow too fast. Um, this is the post picture. Um, the the fistula point, uh, the fistula was occluded completely. Um, this is the case two, just like uh, the previous case. <coughs> we also choose the petrous branch of MMA, and uh, of course the fistula was uh, was occluded um, um, completely. But uh, uh, no, uh, one year follow up, um, no residual fistula and uh, no recurrence. Mm, this, piece, uh, this case is a uh, um, 40 year old male and, uh, um, and you can see the, um, the feeding artery is very complicated. Um, this is the inferior lateral trunk of ICA and this is uh, uh, from middle meningeal artery, Petros, uh, middle meningeal artery um, from ECA. Um, and you can see there he, here is the uh, here is a pica, pica, a meningeal artery, meningeal branch of pica to feed in the fistula. We choose the sensory meningeal arteries. This is a super selective um, angiogram of microcatheter. Can you see? Here, uh, here is where, here is the fistula point, but here just a little like fistula point, but it is not the fistula point, it is the anastomosis between the sensory meningeal artery and the uh, inferior lateral trunk of ICA. So uh, as you can, as showing the uh, red picture, um, the, the, the onyx diffused at the, diffused at the start of uh, inferior lateral trunk. If it is, uh, if not recognized during the post-surgery, maybe the ICA will be, will uh, misembolized. So it is important to know about it, to recognize the anastomosis between the uh, different feeding arteries. And this is the post, uh, post, uh, post angiogram um, just uh, occluded. 
and this is the uh, this is the uh, this is a forty-seven year old male, and uh, and you can see the fading artery is a little different from the previous case. It is the meningeal hypophysal trunk, and uh, uh, you can see the branches of inter uh, internal maxillary artery, and uh, here is the ICA. Here is the meningeal artery of ICA. Of course, we um, choose the posterior branch of MMA, and the fistula point was occluded. This is a post-operation DSA, and this this patient um, this patient we also choose the posterior branch of MMA, and this is the um, posterior. This is the procedure, procedure pictures of uh, onyx injection, and the, this is the um, posterior operation. Mm, the fistula point, the fistula was occluded. But how we do during the operation? Um, as you can see, here is the 44 year old male, old male uh, for hemifacial spasm for four months. And you can see flow, flow voids in the uh, brain. You can see the flow voids around the brain stem um, in the MRI. And, uh, and you can see. And you can see here is the inferior, inferior lateral trunk of ICA. And, and, and the MMA, the MMA of the, of the ECA and transosseous branch of occipital artery here and maybe posterior auricular artery. And this patient is a specific uh, artery, uh, artery feeder, just like this. And um, uh, in the anterior posterior art, uh, artery view, just like uh, just here. Okay. Um, can you see the uh, triangle structure? This triangle stru structure is a uh, is a very uh, this triangle structure is from the tentorial branches of uh, posterior cerebral artery or, post uh, or cerebral superior cerebral artery and to, um, to feed the fistula and, the, and also the pica, also the anterior uh, um, meningeal branch of ICA. Um, in this uh, case, we use the double C arm um, from the from the, we choose the middle meningeal artery, uh, use the double C arm, but we didn't do, uh, we didn't do bilateral femoral, femoral puncture. So we choose to remember the uh, bone marker, bone marker of the, of the fistula and the uh, um, elastomosis between the fading arteries. Just like, uh, just like the the fistula point, just like uh, just uh, is here. So we begin to injection. And the inject the we begin to injection and uh, we injection we do roadmap we do many roadmap to uh, identify the uh, onyx diffusing and where it is diffused. And uh, and you can see. And you can see here is the fistula point. Here is the fistula point. Mm, when the, uh, when during the surgery, if we don't, if we cannot, uh, more, uh, if, if we cannot uh, recognize the uh, diffusion of onyx, we will uh, injection the contrast simultaneous injection, simultaneous injection. So um, this is the uh, fistula point. So we can. And go on to injection, but uh, but uh, to but should to avoid should avoid uh, it is uh, go too fast go to go too far away. And uh, and uh, and uh, there is still residual fistula, and we do uh, uh, during we do uh, angiogram during the, during the operation. The residual fistula, uh, mainly from the inferior lateral trunk, 
and then we go on to injection the uh, injection onyx. And in the lateral view, in the lateral road map, we we can see the we can see the uh, onyx diffused to the uh, inferior lateral trunk. Um, but there is still some distance in the uh, I say, uh, but there is some uh, there is still some distance from the ICA. And uh, and in the last, uh, he uh, the onyx diffused to the post, to the posterior, and in the last we can see. Um, the 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 onyx diffused like this diffused here, and according to the bone mark bone marker, uh, in the uh, according to the bone marker of uh, before surgery, we can judge we can distinguish, um, we can rec rec recognize here the onyx diffused to the posterior of, and just diffused to the uh, feeding artery of from the posterior. So we so the surgery, we end the surgery and do the posterior operation um, angio, angiogram, show the fistula was uh, occluded, uh, was occluded. And uh, uh, the triangle structure of vertebral artery, verte vertebral artery and before surgery. And then now, and then now after the surgery, the triangle structure is disapp disappeared. There is no, there is no triangle structure anymore. So the fistula and the pica, pica branch is also no residual fistula. So the fistula was was completely occluded. Um, here is a recur recurrent and the residual fistula. Um, the uh, the patient was thirty three year old male and dysfunction of because of dysfunction of posterior cranial nerve and you can see the uh, flow voids in the in the MRI and the um, the the flux to the uh, the 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 vein is dilated and um, tortures we choose posterior branch of MMA of MMA and uh, after the first after the first procedure, there is still residual fistula. And uh, three months uh, follow up, the patient is asymptomatic, but the residual failure increased. So we choose to embolize it again um, by, the, by, the ascend, by the branch of ascending pharyngeal arteries. Uh, here, uh, you can see there is, you can see the cost of here. Uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, this is the dispart, dispart, distal branch of ICA, and it was misembolized. So we should be careful of dangerous anastomosis with the millinger branch of ICA, PICA, or ICA. Um, but this patient uh, don't have don't have uh, uh, any uh, symptoms when the uh, PICA was missed. missed um, misembolized because the uh, uh, proximal part of PICA is still uh, is still reserved. Uh, this is the one year follow up, no residual fistula, and the patient is very well. Uh, a special case. This case is that exactly is not the um, SPS DFF because the patient the patient the patient is a forty seven year old male and suddenly because suddenly rattling rattling weakness and difficult speech the patient has a, a history of head trauma half half year half year ago without cranial fracture uh, and the symptoms go aggr aggressively during the half year and the CT showed a hemorrhage in the brainstem uh, and the DSC showed the showed a um, Fistula from the MMA, just from the MMA, only only from the MMA to the MS, to the necessary vein, and then um, to the SPS, um, uh, at last reflux to the tributaries of petrol petrous vein, and um, so 
you can see the dilated dilated petrol vein and the tortuous cerebellar vein uh, and the um, basal vein and the, um, and there are there are uh, there are three directions uh, there are three reflux directions so which the fistula, uh, where is the fistula point we choose uh, uh, super selective of angio, of micro concert uh, first of all we choose, uh, we place the micro concert in the proximal point proximal of the mma and the fistula and the, uh, the fistula and the normal branch of mma both were both were shown so uh, we ad and then we advance the micro concert to cross the um, fistula point. And then uh, the su super selective angiogram showed the only showed the uh, only showed the normally part normally distal branches of MMA. So uh, doing this uh, by doing this, we can identify the uh, fistula point is here. Then we coiling to occlude the fistula. Why we why we don't choose the onyx injection because the because the flow is very high, and uh, and the and the tributaries of petrol vein is very important. If we if we injection onyx maybe at the start of injection and the onyx will flow will diffuse too fast and too far away and uh, Maybe caused maybe caused the infra venous infarction of brainstem. So which was um which was coiling which was coiling the uh, fistula point and the uh, MMA. This is the post operation, and the fistula point is uh, uh, occluded, and the post operation nineteen days CT showed that the hematoma was uh, absorbed mostly, and you can see the um. Coils, you can see the coils is the extracranial. Three months of follow up, the patient is re recovered very well. This patient is very, is very lucky, but not every patient has such fortunate. This patient is a 37 year old male, um, just only did this for one week, and the MRI showed a, showed a, va uh, showed a vascular malformation. But after being found, uh, after being found for two days, it is ruptured. It is ruptured, and you can see. It, it is ruptured and uh, caused intraventricular hemorrhage. And you can see, this here is the hematoma, and here is the uh, rupture point of vein of vein. The DSA uh, revealed. Uh, SPS DVF, and you can see the rupture point of uh, venous of, of the vein. Mm -hmm. And the uh, and the feeding artery is very is very complicated, but unfortunate after three days of DSA, uh, this patient, <laughs> this patient, um. After three days of the DSA, of DSA, uh, edema and hydrocephalus caused the sudden apnea. And then emergency, we did a, we did a emergency EVD, but um, but this patient is still not recover. So it is uh, it is very it's, it is a pity. Uh, okay, I did a uh, did a summary. For the drainage, for the drainage veins, uh, always cross the tentorium and always be tortuous and uh, dilated, and the venous aneurysm is commonly seen, prone to rupture and the, uh, are prone to uh, rupture. Maybe sometimes can compress the near structure such as uh, the trigeminal nerve, uh, the brainstem, the posterior cranial nerve. Uh, maybe uh, when compression, when compress the when compression in the these structures can cause some symptoms of, um, of it. Um, before rupture, maybe uh, before rupture, um, the patients, uh, um, uh, if, if there is no compression 
on the near structure, the patient may the patients may be uh, asymptomatic, especially uh, reflux if especially uh, have the reflux direction of uh, to uh, of the contralateral vein and uh, the cerebellar vein. Um, and the treatment, the transarterial route is recommended, but uh, must be careful of dangerous anastomosis, uh, and need to protect the protect the tor tortures tortures and the dilated vein to avoid venous infarction of brainstem, because the infarction of uh, venous venous infarction of brainstem is also is a disaster, and. Uh, for this lane, for this lane, once been discovered, treatment should be active. So that's all my, that's all my sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ting. Your impressive cases and uh, treatment strategy for this kind of lesions. Uh, we'd like to have uh, some comment or uh, questions from the audience. You may give your expert comments, Professor Yushin. Okay, okay, sure. Uh, I have several uh, questions. Uh, first of all, uh, you presented a very impressive case uh, suffering from a several hemorrhage. So in your experience, are there any difference in venous draining pattern between hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic cases? Um, of course, if the patient uh, has hemorrhages, maybe the symptoms of the, of the patient is very, um, um, most cases, if the patient have hemorrhage in brainstem, um, nearly almost, uh, um, it is uh, it is very difficult to recover. Mm. So, okay. mm. um, if the um, so if the patient is no hemorrhages, and mm. just have some compression symptoms, just like uh, mm. dizziness or. Um, Transgeminal uh, facial spasm or facial numbness. Uh, once, uh, once the DFF was um, discovered, we will do surgery and the patient will recover well. This okay. Mm. And the uh, next question is that uh, you uh, well embolized the shunt with onychus, right? Yeah. From a trans arterial uh, route. And uh, did, did you have a chance to use another embolic materials like um, NVCA or a fill or something? Uh, we rarely do. Uh, we, we rarely uh, use NBC to uh, embolize this uh, S, uh, SPS DFF mm. because uh, um, uh, because SPS uh, because uh, you know um, the reflux of um, of NBC is mm. very difficult for mm -hmm. the for the for this type of DFF. We always uh, use NBC in the um, spinal spinal uh, spinal DFF. Okay, so uh, you you frequently selected the posterior branch of MMA for uh, embolic root, so. What is the reason to select the posterior branch? Because uh, MMA has a has a stable, uh, stable, st stable route to uh, in, enter the uh, cranial, mm -hmm. uh, and the form is spinosome. So, um, SD, uh, DFF is the uh, lane uh, occurs in the dura. So mm -hmm. if we want to embolize the fistula wheel, we must uh, uh, enter the cranial. And if uh, we must uh, place our microcatheter in intracranial. Uh, mm -hmm. If we choose uh, an occipital artery or uh, um, posterior auricular artery, this artery is uh, superficial, close mm -hmm. superficial, and uh, there is no stable, um, mm -hmm. stable route to in enter the, the cranial. So uh, it is very difficult to diffuse for onyx. Okay. My mm -hmm. last question is, um, uh, you mentioned 
you show that the case, the embolic material migrated to the another artery, right? So you said that the, uh, it is important to avoid the embolic material migration to other important arteries through dangerous anosmosis. I, I, I totally agree with you. So my question is, uh, you embolize some shunt through uh, ascending pharyngeal artery or accessory meningeal artery. We sometimes are afraid of the cranial nerve policy by injection of onychis or other embolic materials. Uh, how do you avoid cranial nerve policy uh, during transarterial embolization? As we know, the ascending pharyngeal artery will feed the posterior cranial nerve. Sometimes it will cause the uh, neuro, um, neuro, um, neuro nerve uh, will cause the uh, feeding artery question of neural nerve. But uh, uh, as we know, uh, ascending, uh, ascending pharyngeal arteries has, uh, has the branches of melindro and uh, uh, neuro, neuro uh, has the branches to uh, feed the melindro and uh, uh, feed the dura and feed the new, uh, uh, nerve. Thank and you. if we, if, hmm. if we can choose, if we can selective choose the selective choose the um, uh, um, bilingual branch of ascending hmm. ascending pharyngeal artery, it can sometimes it can to some extent to avoid the um, feeding artery of cranial nerve. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for your wonderful lecture about uh, challenging embolization of uh, this uh, SPS lesions. Uh, we are learned a, a lot from you, your lecture today. Thank you, Professor thank Ting. You, thank you. Thank you. All. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ting. May I ask Professor Ting about these lesions which uh, come with vertigo and dizziness and all? How quick does it recover after your? embolization procedure uh, how to quick uh, so how the patients recover after this procedure is it immediate recovery from their vertigo mm -hmm. and all or it takes some time to recover to uh, for, for which case to recover for recover. patients with vertigo one case you showed patient had some vertigo ah. and all because it is a traumatic uh, case, uh, actually, uh, actually, the case, the fistula point is not uh, um, is exactly uh, the SPS DFF. And this patient, uh, uh, when the when this patient go in the go to go in the hospital, the the patient is um, in coma. First, oh. first of all, the limb weakness is aggressively, and when when he came to in the hospital. The, he is in coma. So we don't have confidence. We, we also don't have, we also don't have confidence so, uh, in his recover, but he uh, recovers very well at last. Right, thank you very much. Any questions from Professor Paulo Kadri? Would you like to ask any questions? No, I just would like to compliment. Beautiful lecture, difficult case, congratulations. Thank mm. you very much, Michael Liu Bun Singh. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you, Professor, for a very nice presentation. I just want to find out from you if a scenario in a ruptured case uh, with a significant uh, amount of subdural that requiring surgery, in which case that uh, you will proceed uh, with uh, embolization and when will you do it? Uh, in which case that you think is suitable for surgical uh, 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 resection of the fistula? Um, you mean the Unfortunate case? Yeah, in bleeding case, in bleeding case that need cranotomy. Uh, what type of cases that you think that you, you need to do uh, uh, embolization or which one you think that can, can be treated surgically? Uh, you, uh, you mean the craniotomy and the uh, endovascular treatment uh, which to right, uh, right, how to choose? Right, right, uh, yeah, right. Um, actually, uh, for DFF, Mm, in the vascular treatment is the first uh, first option option mm. uh, so uh, for this uh, for this dff because he, he, because it has many feeding arteries from the eca such as the occipital artery such as the per, um, 
posterior, posterior auricular artery. When we do um, craniotomy, when we, um, when we cut the scalp, it, will, it is very difficult to, uh, to bleed. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So uh, we uh, choose uh, to in the vascular treatment. If, the, if, if in the vascular treatment uh, field, we, mm. can st we can still uh, try craniotomy. But if we, but if you uh, try craniotomy first, and you will uh, cut the uh, trans transarterial root, you will cut some arteries of the uh, failing arteries, such as middle uh, meningeal artery, and they will cause the transarterial transarterial uh, intervention impossible. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was indeed a wonderful session. Professor Yoshimura, any concluding remarks from your side? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we learned uh, uh, a lot from uh, two speakers uh, in this session. One is uh, surgery and one is uh, endovascular treatment. Both treatments are difficult for this kind of field, but uh, uh, if we learn uh, like to speakers, we may be able to uh, challenge uh, to treat these patients in the near future. Thank you for your wonderful lectures. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. So in that case, I'll wind this up officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato. I would like to sincerely thank both speakers of today, Professor Paulo Kadri and Dr. Wang Ting and the Chairs, Professor Roy Thomas Daniel, Professor Shinichi Yoshimura for the time and support for the educational initiatives of the ACNS. A special thanks to Professor Shubin for supporting us in our educational ventures and suggesting world-class speakers as well as broadcasting these webinars on, in China and WeChat, on the WeChat channel. Today, we have around 1,575 audiences who are watching this live. A special thanks to my co-host Liu Bun Seng also for joining me today. So until we all meet on next Wednesday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.